Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the hello. <laughs> uh, welcome to the Wisconsin Maritime Museum. Uh, my name is Caroline Deemer. I am the programming coordinator here at the museum, and I'm so excited to see that all of you guys came out for this month's Think and Drink. Uh, Think and Drinks are a monthly series that happen on the first Thursday evening of every month. Um, they are free talks, so um, if you like this one, check out the rest of the our year's lineup because we got some pretty exciting talks. All of the talks this year in celebration of the USS Cobia's 80th anniversary of launching are going to be about interesting and often untold stories from World War II. Um, so there's a lot of exciting things, but the one that I'm really excited for today is uh, about Disney and dolphins. So um, join me in welcoming the submarine curator for the Wisconsin Maritime Museum, Karen Duvall, and she's going to tell us about Disney's influence on submarine uh, warfare insignia. So yeah, Karen. <laughs> All right, so it was what, August you asked me to do this, I think? And at that time, I probably could have given you a five minute talk. I can talk a lot longer tonight. <laughs> uh, had a lot of fun researching this, so I hope this is gonna be a fun presentation because I'm the one that likes to find the stories, the interesting stories, the funny stories, because I was looking at all of these patches and going, what's the story behind that one? So we'll get to the fun patches in Disney in a moment, but <clears throat> can everyone hear me okay? Is this good? You don't need like the mic. You want me to talk? Mark, can you hear me? <laughs> All right. So first we will start with dolphins. Um, and yes, kind of sort of talking about the bottlenose dolphin. Uh, submarines, submariners earn their dolphins by demonstrating vast knowledge of all the systems on the boat. Uh, the your officer is going to take you through the boat and you have a qual card and he's going to ask you, how does that system work? How does this system work? And if you pass it, you get marked off. If not, go back and do more studying. Um, earning your dolphins is considered to be one of the most difficult to earn in the Navy. And new non-quals, those who are not qualified and have received their dolphins, have just one year to successfully complete their qualification process and uh, final and pass their final evaluations. Uh, submariners carry out some of the most difficult, uh, valuable and secretive missions. That's why they're known as the silent service. They have to keep silent about almost every aspect at their work. So they're proud of what they do. And because of this, the dolphins took on an even greater significance and symbolism. Um, they became a share or an unspoken way to communicate with identity. So if you see someone wearing dolphins, you know what that person went through. You know, you had the same kind of experience. Um, and it, that's how they, they really bond over that. Uh, sub vets regularly wear dolphins on hats, on vests, clothing, belt buckles, you name it. Uh, once you wear the dolphins, they are forever emblazoned on your heart. You can wear them for the rest of your life. They'll always be there. So why dolphins though? Uh, dolphins are the attendants to Poseidon uh, and the patron deity of sailors, sometimes referred to as the sailor's friend. Uh, they were chosen to represent the submarine service because of the characteristics in ways dolphins dive and surface. So I'll start with uh, the US dolphins. Um, <clears throat> these were stylized version of the bottlenose dolphin and scales were added basically for artistic license. Uh, <clears throat> thought it looked better apparently. Criteria is the, for the submarine warfare is a uniform breast insignia worn by enlisted men and officers of the United States Navy to indicate that they are qualified in submarines. So officers would get the gold dolphins and enlisted got the silver dolphins. Uh, the top left there is a patch during World War II, the enlisted had their dolphins embroidered on their uniform. They didn't actually have the, the pin yet. That was, I think, in the 50, 1950. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, they were allowed to wear them for the duration of your career once you received them. 
The bottom one there is the submarine combat patrol insignia. It's worn by officers and men of the Navy subservice who have completed a, any combat patrols uh, during wartime. Your first one, you receive the actual pin. After that, you get a star for every successful patrol after that. So it's, and once you get the pin, the three stars, that's four. If you get to five, then you get a silver star to put on the bottom to count all your patrols. But what does it mean to earn your dolphins? Got some quotes from some of my family and friends who uh, have their dolphins. Mark says, it meant I made it. Some stuff was hard to grasp, but I made it. Remember, you don't have them when you get out, get to your boat. You only have so much time to earn them and you're out. You'll get teased relentlessly until you get them, but everyone is willing to help you. Whoops. Um, I also asked my brother-in-law, which I, you know, as my brother-in-law, I'd say, hey, that's a funny picture, but um, he was he was excited. It was a little bit different quote. That was the day I stopped being a liability to the crew. The day I have proven I could be trusted to do the right things when the safety of the ship and crew were at stake. So dolphins are a big deal. Um, but it's not just the U.S. that has uh, dolphins to distinguish their submarine crews. These are some of the countries that use dolphins in their insignia. Uh, some use ships, a combination of the both, or subs. Um, some little interesting facts from some of these countries here. Indonesia operated 14 ex-Soviet whiskeys until 1990. Uh, Japan bought their first sub from the U.S. in 1905. It was a Holland class and copied U.S. Dolphin's design. Uh, first sub in Netherlands was built by the Electric Boat Company plans. In 1906, an electric boat is where Cobia was built. Um, <clears throat> Norway, they sometimes call their badge CODs instead of dolphins. The UK, uh, their badge was created in 1958, and a crew uh, like to call it a sausage roll or sausage on a stick. <laughs> uh, this one was an optional insignia, so some of the guys refused to wear it because they hated it that much. Um, these are some countries that use submarines in their design. Uh, something a little bit different. Saudi Arabia issued theirs in the 90s, uh, possibly the latest to add a badge to their submarine service of those who have them. Greece calls theirs the uh, Delphine, first modern sub to fire torpe uh, torpedo. <clears throat> and South Africa, their first sub was built in 1970. All their subs are named after heroic women. I like that. Smart. <laughs> Germany and Russia or Soviet Union get their own page. There was a lot to unpack there. Uh, Germany had 57 U-boats at the start of World War II. They built a total of 1,190 during the war, but lost 70% of them. Uh, that top badge there is the U-boat war badge from World War II. Uh, it's it's not a qualification badge like the U.S. one. It's more like a, an award, sort of like the Purple Heart um, or Bronze Star, that kind of award. The bottom one is the authorized version that was designed in 1984 and similar to a U-boat class that was introduced in 1944. Russia, there's just a handful of examples there. They have over 1,000 Soviet commemorative badges that have been designed and not all of them are official. So I picked some that looked different, familiar. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> submarine commander's badge on the top there uh, was designed in 1943. And as far as I know, it's still current. Uh, similar variation was made for the movie Hunt for Red October. And if you've seen that one, uh, only senior commanders wear this badge. Uh, but in the movie, everyone got to wear it. First, movies are accurate. Um, I've often heard in my time here that life is simple. Either you're qualified or you're not. 
uh, the little badge there, kind of hard to read. These dolphins, once you pin them on your chest, leave deep marks right over your heart long after the uniform has been put away. So, thanks, Roxy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move on. Um, so that's the whole dolphins that are a big part of being a submariner. Um, and now we're going to talk about insignia because that's where it gets really interesting and fun. What is an insignia? A patch or an object that indicates a person's official military rank or membership in a group or organization. So these go first insignia go way back um, to the Bronze Age. Or is it Bronze Age? Knights who are fighting each other, they're all wearing like the big uh, suit of armor and they can't tell who is who. So they put designs on their shields and their uniforms so that they could decide, you know, friend or foe. Um, and that came about back, or it was needed again in World War I when they started using airplanes and they needed to decide again who is friend and foe in the skies. So those airplanes started putting uh, different designs on the fuselage. Uh, this one here is uh, from the Lafayette Escadrille. I don't speak French, so hopefully that's close enough. <clears throat> um, the Lafayette Flying Corps is a name that was given to American volunteers who flew in the French Air Force during World War I. Uh, it includes pilots who flew with the actual Lafayette Escadrille Squadron. Um, that was a flying squadron that was unique because the squadron was composed almost entirely of volunteers from the U.S. Um, this unit insignia became an icon during that time. Pilots painted this colorful emblem onto the sides of their aircraft because displaying the stars and stripes when America was still neutral was not the best idea. Um, so the next best thing, something that was an equal symbol of American spirit, was an Indian warrior in full headdress. Um, the first artistic effort of the squadron adopted the seminal Indian image pattern from an ammunition box logo. And then they switched it up a little bit and make it look a little bit more mean. Air Force, I know, but we, it, it relates to submarines. <laughs> um, <clears throat> The reason I have this on here, uh, General William Billy Mitchell from Wisconsin, Mitchell Airport in Milwaukee. Um, he actually had his own personal insignia. You can see it's on the plane. It was a, a red background with the eagle and the, the wreath there. Um, he was a champion of military aviation, praised for his vision and hailed as one of the forefathers of the US Air Force. Uh, he had that painted on his plane, and then in 2007, the Air Force approved the Combat Action Medal, which is based on his insignia. So that's a little honor to him. The first credited World War II insignia um, was for the Navy Ob Observation Squadron. Uh, pioneer Walter Lance designed an Oswald the Rabbit logo for the squadron in the 1930s. Oswald the Lucky Rabbit was originally designed by Disney. However, sometime along the way, he lost the rights to it, to his distributor, uh, and his distributor used, kept, or re kept on using it. Um, it turned out to be a good thing for Walt Disney because that gave him time to focus more on his new character, Mickey Mouse, and the feature Steamboat Willie. And summary names, which are basically the whole reason the patches are the way they are sometimes. <laughs> uh, the first sub is the USS Holland, first American submarine, SS-1. So USS meaning United States ship or United States submarine. SS is the designation for submarines. So SS-1, it was the first submarine in the American Navy. Cobia was the 245th at least authorized um, to be built. The first couple had simple uh, designations. They didn't have names in the beginning. So SS-45, um, SS-139. Later on, they did get some names, but they were started with the numbers. And fun fact, there is a SS 19.5. <laughs> so 
It's on my poster. <laughs> um, during the war, they were named after denizens of the deep and fierce fighting fish. Um, some of them don't sound fierce and fighting, but that was their, their main goal. And later on, they were states and people and cities and things like that. Oops. Oh, Georgia. That's uh, my brother-in-law's sub that he was on. So I included that. So Holland was the first submarine built for the Navy. Uh, John Holland designed it. It was the first uh, submersible used and recorded was the Bushnell's Turtle in 1775. Holland was the first American sub and was acquired by the Navy on April 11th, 1900. So that is now considered the submarine birthday um, every year. So 100 and going on 123 years. Um, a special subgroup amongst the uh, submarine veterans in the country, though, is the Holland Club, named after the first sub. Um, it's an exclusive group within the U.S. sub that or, uh, organization where the core requirement is that you have eligible, uh, eligibility once you've designated qualified in submarines for 50 years. So once you've been qualified for 50 years, you have, they do a little ceremony and they your base usually will get you the patch and the certificate. And you see some older sub vets, you'll see a lot of Holland patches, Holland club on the earlier boats. Here we start with the fun patch designs where I had way too much fun going, what's the story behind that one? <clears throat> I couldn't figure out the story behind the middle one there. That's for D1, uh, sometimes known as Narwhal, patches circa 1920. That's that one. Plunger A1 was the very first patch design for submarines. Um, and then you got the one with the weird guy sticking his head out of the, the sub. And Trout has a funny story. The reason he's got 24 carat gold or 20, gold bars on a torpedo. This wasn't the original design. I actually have that later on. But in the beginning of the war, Trout um, was assigned to send uh ammunition to Corregidor and it was early in the war and the Philippines had emptied their banks of all the money because they didn't want it to get in the hands of the Japanese. So they burned all the paper money, saved the coin, silver pesos. So when Trout was leaving, their boat was lighter because they took off all that ammunition. And even though they put on fuel and other things, it still wasn't heavy enough. So they were giving 20 tons of gold bar and silver coins to use as ballast to get back to their port. Uh, for this, the captain received the Navy Cross and Army Distinguished Service Cross, and all the crew members were awarded the Army Silver Star, which is the third highest award. Um, the boat itself received the Presidential Uni Unit Citation. So when you dig into patches, they have a fun story sometimes. <laughs> All right, into the fierce fighting fish. Uh, <clears throat> Bakuna and lionfish there are museum subs. These are just some of the examples of, of subs that are patches that are out there. And we got uh, Flasher sank the second most tonnage of any submarine in World War II. The number two spot used to be Rasher on our boat, but sometime in the last couple of years, someone must have recalculated the measurements and Tang took over the first spot uh, with 116 tons. Flasher did 100,000 tons. Rasher got 99,000. So Rasher got pushed from two to three. And then some of them were designed by the crew. And again, it's World War II. They have enemies. So that's going to be reflected in some of their patches. The uh, scamp was used on a coin. The USS Char does have a clothing one. They added a bikini to her. <laughs> and USS Wahoo, um, from what I can tell, was named after Chief Wahoo, who was a fairly common nickname for any generic indigenous character. Um, there was also a popular newspaper strip called Big Chief Wahoo that ran from 1936 to 1947. So that's more than likely why Wahoo has an indigenous with a headdress. And Growler, they did 11 patrols, but was lost on November 1944, possibly by its own torpedo. 
and then cobia. I can't leave cobia, all right? So that's the cobia patch on the left. The one on the right, that was when cobia was in Milwaukee. So swap out the flag for a beer mug. Um, and a lot of people look at this and they say, it looks like a parrot. It looks like a beak, feathers in the back. But when you find the original drawing on the commissioning cover, it looks a little different. It's actually a mouse. Um, looks more fish-like, a little less bird-like. So on Tuesday, I'm looking at this and I zoomed in, there's initials underneath the fins, SSC. Well, Sam S. Chiovoloni, if I said it correctly, was the master of ceremonies. He was on the commissioning crew and he did the first two patrols on Cobia. So as best I can tell, he is probably the one that designed Cobia's logo which I just discovered two days ago, and that was fun. <laughs> and because we have the full program just for fun, their menu of stuffed celery, olives, pickles, uh, sliced meats, potato salad, rolls, butter, and cake. Uh, their events included cutting the ship's cake with a saber, as usual, a waltz contest, a jitterbug contest, and an Irish jig contest. <laughs> I throw random facts out there. This one is just basically the patches I found the most funny. <laughs> um, why there's a horse-drawn wagon with a torpedo? I could not figure that one out. Uh, let's see, Pike looks like it's sitting in a wheelchair with like an ice pack tied to his head. <laughs> I tried to find out why, um, couldn't figure out why, but. Uh, Pike was the first all-welded submarine, so that gave that sub greater depths and protection against depth charges. Let's see, the other ones are the USS Cabazon, named for saltwater fish, means big head in Spanish. It's not so bad, except you look at the mouth and it looks like a person in a costume. Uh, the Gabalon next to it. Oops. Um, it's just funny looking, but that's a Disney design. In the middle, we got Toro, and it's a bull with steam coming out. But when I first looked at it, and I can't unsee it now, it looks like two hands shoving torpedoes up his nose. <laughs> <laughs> the middle one has looks like he's wearing a scarf. Rattan, we all thought for sure it was Disney. As far as I can tell, it's not a Disney design. Uh, the bottom two on the right, Razorback has the cute little sub, while the one next to it, both of them for Razorback, looks like he's about to cut them with a razor. Um, two completely different designs for the same boat. The one on the bottom left there with the green fish, try to figure out, one, what's the name, what sub is it? It doesn't have a name, just SSN670. Turns out it was for the USS Finback, the second submarine named Finback. And when you look for information on it, there's only one story that it highlights everything. And the headline was Topless Dancer Incident. <laughs> and it is one of the most notorious incidents in the history of the Navy's nuclear powered submarine force. As they were leaving Port Canaveral, Florida after a major overhaul, Captain thought it was a good idea to reward the men by allowing a topless dancer to perform on the dive sails. Uh, Navy found out, said, get your butts back here. Captain was relieved of duty and found guilty for uh, unsafe navigation. It's a little bit distracting, I suppose. So you never know when you look into the history of why is that patch the way it is, you might find something completely different. Um, after the war, several of the subs were named after famous and successful submarines during World War II. These are just four of the Manitowoc subs that um, had later subs, Hawkbill, I don't know, SSN 666, a little creepy. Um, Pogies patch I like from yesterday to tomorrow. It focuses on, you know, gives homage to the first one. Puffer, the Manitowoc sub 268, though, has a little interesting story. It was credited with being down the longest during World War II. They endured nearly a 38-hour um, depth charging. 
from two Japanese sub chasers. So they were underwater for 38 hours. If you've been on the sub tour, you've hopefully learned you don't want to be down more than 24. So that was a bit rough. Um, it wasn't just Manitowoc subs that were <clears throat> uh, renamed for some of the newer ones. These are just some of the fun examples. We do have the normal looking trout one, not the gold bar. That one's more fun. Um, one on here to look at, uh, Dace, or no, Darter. Darter and Dace attacked a convoy in October of 1944. However, during that time, Darter got stuck on a shoal and they tried to get it off the shoal and it didn't work, completely failed. So they transferred the entire Darter crew over to Dace. They set charges to blow it up and destroy any um, top secret information. Those didn't work very well. So Dace fired torpedoes and they hit the shoal instead. Um, so they said, take off, we'll try it again later. Rock, one of the Manitowoc subs came along. He, they gave a shot at it, didn't work either. Finally, Nautilus came around and did enough damage to, to move on. Um, interesting though, to keep the uh, spirit decor for the crew, they transferred the entire crew to a new sub that was being built here in Manitowoc, the U.S. says, what is it, um, Menhaden. So connections to Manitowoc. What else we got? Scorpion. There were two scorpions. Hopefully not a third because both of those were lost. Uh, Trout I had mentioned. Barb, the original Barb was a famous submarine. Their commander, uh, Eugene Flucky, became an admiral, also a Medal of Honor winner. One fun fact about them is they blew up a train. So they have a train on their battle flag. Pretty interesting story. Uh, after that, they started to, they went through this big program where they called the 41 for Freedom. Um, it refers to the U.S. Navy's fleet ballistic missile subs that were commissioned between 1959 and 1967. Um, they, the, there was a treaty that limited the number of American sub-launched ballistic missile tubes to 256, which means that's 41 boats with 16 missile launchers. Um, they didn't want them to get more than that. Uh, it was built as a deterrent during the Cold War to keep keep everyone from trying to fire at us, but they could fire missiles from submarines. Uh, the last one in that group is the SSBN Will Rogers. A lot of subs in that time. You see Daniel Boone, Tecumseh after presidents, and then where you got Will Rogers. Uh, one though, obvious one, Rick Over. He is basically the father of the modern nuclear Navy. He spent three decades working on the nuclear submarine program. His service exceeded the career of all of the four star admirals. Um, he basically spent a total of 63 years uh, during his career. And although I heard he wasn't the nicest guy, he did a great job with the nuclear subs. And then they were named for states and cities. And the main reason is because fish don't vote. So we don't need those fish names. We want to uh, honor the states and get funding from them and votes. Um, and you see they get a lot more interesting and intricate. California, uh, they all have mottos now. We got California, silence is golden. Missouri, united we stand, divided we fall, silence is golden. It's important for the subservice. <laughs> Washington, I think it's just a really cool patch. Well, how did I skip to Jimmy Carter? Um, <laughs> preserving peace, prepared for war. Texas is an obvious one. Don't mess with Texas. Hawaii, defend the land. And South Dakota is under sea we rule. So they all have some fun sayings. Um, Wisconsin, there is going to be the USS Wisconsin, Columbia class. SSN827, but too soon to have a patch for that yet. So I'm pretty excited to see what they feature on that patch in about nine years. Uh, there is a subclass 
of the Seawolf class fast attack subs, and that would be the USS Jimmy Carter. Um, he was the 39th president who, and the only president to have qualified on submarines. Um, this is the only submarine to be named for a living president. Also, only the uh, third submarine and very few other vessels that was named for uh, living people at the time. Um, and then, yeah, it was extensively modified, so it's its own subclass. Now to the fun part, World War II and Disney. Um, Hollywood's war contributions uh, was morale boosting, war dramas, troop entertainment, and training films. They tried to help train all these new people that were, were being drafted and sent to war, and also all of the home front efforts that the communities went through. Just one day after Pearl Harbor, the Navy asked Walt for training films. It ended up being a total of 20 films on aircraft identification. <clears throat> uh, Walt ended up converting his brand new Burbank facility into a vital war production plant. They were actually a war facility. Um, <clears throat> they did all of this though without profit at Walt's assistance. So all of their government contracts, he only charged them cost of labor and supplies, just enough to keep the buildings open and running. But he had been an ambulance driver in World War I. He knew what war was like, and he wasn't about to profit on it. So he donated all the insignias later on, no cost. Anyone who asked, they tried to make one for them. Um, but that was his biggest thing. Even though the training films were not very creative or artistic, they were worth it. If it saved lies and shortened the war, um, he was happy to do them. They made um, not just training films, but films for the home front, out of the frying pan into the firing line. Poor Pluto doesn't get bacon grease anymore. Uh, even, even he helped. Um, they made a total of 170 training films use characters and humor to make the dull films more interesting and memorable. Um, hundreds of thousands of feet of film were produced for the US military. Also made educational and propaganda shorts that helped the war effort, um, morale building posters and artwork for war related organizations and publications, insignia, which we'll talk more on, and entertaining shorts and troop entertainment. Uh, including variety shows at local hospitals for wounded uh, soldiers. As I mentioned, Disney was technically a war industry factory. They had swing shifts, ID badges, and secret areas for military contracts or closed off areas. Um, <clears throat> most of the workers were able to avoid the draft. However, several um, volunteered, 174 employees served in total from Disney Studios, which was about a quarter of the total Disney workforce. Um, Disney even had a service flag in the parking lot with the blue star for every employee that served or a gold star if they were lost. After the war, most of that work was unusable, so they vaulted it in 1945. So I wonder what's still there. Fun fact, they made gas masks for children. Added this just for a fun fact. Um, <laughs> Disney helped design children's gas masks that looked like Mickey Mouse during World War II. Government distributed over 40 million gas, pass, gas masks to men, women, and children during World War II. However, since the adult ones were too large for the children, they needed uh, smaller ones, and they thought this would make war less scary for the kids. Not a bad concept, but that doesn't look less scary to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, these masks actually were never used, and now they're just stored in museums and probably some people's basements. I got a pin. <laughs> um, the first official request for studio design insignia came in 1939 when a Naval, Avi Naval Reserve Aviation Cadet wrote to Walt Disney requesting an insignia for the Naval Air Squadron aboard the aircraft carrier 
USS Wasp. That's the logo on the top middle there that they came up with. Um, <clears throat> he assigned the job to studio artist Van Kaufman, who fulfilled the request by designing an insignia featuring an angry wasp with boxing gloves. In fact, boxing gloves you'll see is quite popular with these patches. Um, it was Walt's idea to establish a unit devoted to producing custom military insignia for free to U.S. and allied forces. The special department provided colorful Disney insignia for any allied military units that requested them free of charge. He put draftsman Hank Porter in charge of the department, and they ended up producing nearly 1,300 insignia upon request. Each one was unique among Disney studios and each a standalone masterpiece. Some more examples. Um, artists tried to infuse each and every design with wit, imagination, and a stamp of individuality. Uh, creative style, they were requesting sailors, soldiers, and arm that they deserved something awesome. Um, the higher ups, the World War II brass, weren't quite a fan of the cartoon designs, but the, the crew loved them, the men loved them, troops. So they said, all right, as long as that helps your morale, go for it. A bunch of tons of characters were used. Um, in the beginning, actually, there were no commercial characters that could be used in a design. There was some contract there. So instead, they started with 17 recognizable Disney characters um, on a total of 38 different times that they used random Disney characters. Characters included Donald Duck, Pluto, Thumper, several other characters from Fantasia, uh, a baby Pegasus, Cinturette, Hyacinth the Hippo, uh, Ben Alligator, and uh, by the summer of 1942, the restrictions had evaporated and Disney characters appeared in more designs. Donald was popular, he's the most popular actually, um, because Mickey wasn't a soldier, Minnie, Pluto, and Goofy were ineligible to be soldiers, um, and he was his unsuitability to be a soldier made for a great comedy. Uh, Pluto, though, made a good mascot for the army. Um, several requests were made for the Fab Five, Mickey, Minnie, Pluto, Goofy, and Donald. Uh, but other characters were included, Jiminy Cricket, Pinocchio, Flower, Daisy Duck, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, uh, Little Hiawatha. All the seven dwarves were used, Ferdinand the Bull, Snow White, and Peg Leg Pete, which is actually on the Pogies, one of the Mantuck subs uh, logo. A large number were also created from scratch or from nameless background characters. So who used what? Donald Duck, most popular. Actually, I forgot to change that number. It's more about over 200 that Donald Duck was uh, requested and used. Pluto comes in number two, around 45-ish. They're not certain on any of these numbers, so they're kind of approximate. Mickey, actually number three, but um, he wasn't used very often because he has an unwarlike demeanor. Peg Leg Pete, he's more intimidating, so he was around 20-ish, Goofy, and Jiminy Cricket was actually up there in the top. Oh, wait. <laughs> so Mickey Mouse was more suited for the home front. I mean, it doesn't look right with Mickey firing guns on top of torpedo. That's just not in his character, so he wasn't used very often, um, but he was at home to for the workers and buy war bonds, that kind of thing more suited for the home front. Women also weren't very popular. There wasn't a lot of requests for Mickey and, or Minnie and Daisy. Uh, they were rare due to the lack of women in the military, except for one exception, the WASPs, the Women Air Force Service Pilots. Um, they asked for permission to use the image of Fifanella um, as their official mascot, and the Disney company granted them that permission. So Fifanella was a female gremlin designed by Walt Disney for a proposed film um, uh, based on a book called The Gremlins. Uh, the logo was included on their leather flying jackets. Um, the characters on above, they actually used several versions of the gremlins. Yeah. 
when I was going to Arizona for the winter, I met a woman in our church that was in the first class of the law. Nice. She just passed away in, in oh. 2011, 91 years old. Wow. Wow. That's neat. Thanks for sharing. Um, <clears throat> I also had uh, Daisy Duck up there. Got a got a one patch at least. Phoebe the CB is in the middle there. Uh, in 1944, members of the CBs wrote to the studio asking for a deliciously feminine queen bee with rosebud lips, dewy bedroom eyes, and an atomizer to make her deadlier than the male. Because <laughs> he only carries a Tommy gun. <laughs> it's World War II sailors. Um, a good percentage of the earliest designs came from um, our allies after December 7th. Uh, French, Poland, Can Canadians, South Africans, British. Um, the most famous design, though, being Donald Duck for the HMS Illustrious. Uh, it was at the request of Lord Mountbatten, Louis Mountbatten, who is the great grandson of Queen Victoria. Uh, Churchill gave him the assignment and wanted to uh, get some goodwill going in the U.S. This is before we, we joined the war. So he sent him on a goodwill tour. And he, on his way to Pearl Harbor, he stopped off in L.A., visited the studios and said, that's cool. I like that. Can you do one for me? Um, so they designed this version. This is just some other Disney designs that I found. Patches actually kind of match for once. The patch for palm fret I thought was like shoes or sandals. It's actually pants. <laughs> you look at the drawing. A lot of times the drawings are better than the actual patch. Um, Hank Porter designed roughly 30 insignia for submarines. And I believe seven of the Manitowoc subs. One of our other volunteers messaged me yesterday, gave me some additional information on this one that already existed. This is for USS Bea. They completed five patrols during the war. The original design there uh, is a logo that features a bear ferociously ripping and chewing apart the naval ensign of Japan. Uh, according to Wayne though, the guy who talked to Disney had a deep Southern accent so when he requested something with the Baya, it came out kind of like bear, bear, Baya. So they think it's that's why there's a bear on the patch. Guys weren't happy that it didn't include their fish, so this was the concept that they came up with. Um, this is a picture of the Baya that was hanging in the um, Ford battery during World War II. Uh, and originally I did this because I go, how the heck did we go from a ferocious bear to this? <laughs> <laughs> um, this is actually, uh, Hank, or, uh, Wayne provided awesome story behind this. Um, this is the design from the 50s and the 60s. And it showed their connection to the Naval Electronics Laboratory in San Diego. Apparently all hush hush that they carried a group of scientists with them. Now that makes sense. <laughs> so a bulk of their designs were created at the studio. Um, didn't feature Disney characters, but hundreds of emblems were created using fanciful images of mammals, birds, insects, fish, and uh, caricatured inanimate objects. Uh, they drew inspiration from the animal kingdom, apes, bears, lions for strength, Birds for flying units, tortoises for armored vehicles. Um, other designs included frogs, beavers, raccoons, dogs, cats, horses, insects, spiders, and crustaceans. All kinds of designs used. And fish for subs. Made sense. Uh, Porter explained that he gave each request a logical treatment. Fighting squadrons would get a combative animal as their mascot. Newly organized squadrons might get a fledgling bird. While submarine designs almost always featured an image of the fish the submarine was named after. Um, for Walt, the insignia, they were not an actual government project, but more of a personal undertaking. 
The daily arrival of requests prompted Disney to summon Hank Porter to his office early in 1942. He said, Mr. You have yourself a job. Just settle down to it. Make as many insignia as you can. If you get overloaded with work, let me know. A few months later, he was nearly 200 designs behind schedule. Um, it didn't take long for them to all start piling in. And as fellow co-workers were drafted or assigned to work on other film projects, uh, left him kind of on his own. So as best they can tell, all the designs from 43, 44, and 45 were designed by Porter. Well, we jump into Manitowoc a little bit. Um, <laughs> did I move that out? This uh, is actually for USS Manitowoc PF61. Commissioned here, uh, not, not here, commissioned in 1944, was actually built in uh, by the Globe Shipbuilding Company in Superior, Wisconsin. Sponsor was the wife of the mayor of Manitowoc at the time. Uh, they did a lot of, they had special weather equipment on board, so they did a lot of weather and data testing before uh, the attacks like D-Day and all that. They tested a lot of weather before they went out and did the battle. Um, it was actually sold to France in 1947 and scrapped in 1958. So one trying to find something named Manitowoc in our or in our database is near impossible. So I said Google. <laughs> <laughs> I mean it fits, but it's not exactly what I was looking for. So the best I could do is show you Sheboygan, which is 57, not 61. It's close. So it looks something like that. <laughs> Um, to get into the Disney design Manitowoc submarines, Pogi, before I found that drawing, I stared at the patch. I'm like, that face looks familiar. And I settled on Pete, and sure enough, it was Pete. Um, he was before, he's been in quite a few films way, way back when, the Steamboat Willie. Ray, I actually prefer both of the drawings over the patch. The patch gets a little muddled with the yellow. It's hard to see that that's like a face with eyes, um, but one of the Disney designs. All of us here love the design of Hawkbill, but we hate the patch because it ended up like this. <laughs> Instead of a cute bug, it's got what looks like a creepy bald guy. <laughs> Doesn't quite translate well, but the design, original design was cute. Uh, Golay and Rock were also Disney Designs Rock is actually used quite a bit when you look at the books and different things. Um, that's one of the many, one of the examples that's used quite often to uh, feature submarines that were Disney Designs. Uh, a lot of the designs, the originals, they were either changed right away, changed throughout the war. There's all kinds of different designs sometimes for the same boat. Um, as you see, a different option for Golay was drawn featuring a caricature of Japanese Prime Minister Hideki Tojo. So he's actually featured in a few of the designs. Uh, but this, the rock one was designed for the submarine base in Pearl Harbor in 1945. He did a full color print for them. Pompon, identical. Hammerhead, that's the original Disney design. Changed slightly a little bit. Uh, I, hammerhead. I mean, names I've looked at, <laughs> Hammerhead. Um, and those were the Disney design ones. So I'm sorry to everyone who had lied to you the last 20 years. I assumed all 18 were Disney. Turns out there's, what, seven? Um, Jaleo was on here. That one stays pretty much similar. Guitaro, we love the design better again, and not as much the patch. I don't know what happened to the fish in translation. <laughs> Silly. Um, Ice Fish and Hardhead were also local artists that, uh, not Disney, but they looked a little different in their drawings. It's World War II. Turns out several of them were designed by Henry Burns, and that name sounded familiar because he was the official photographer for um, <clears throat> Manitowoc Shipbuilding Company. A lot of the construction photos, launching photos, things like that, those top secret photos, um, he took care of. His photos often appeared in Life magazine, and he also received several 
awards. So I look closely at the one photo and I can see designs on his back wall for hardhead, ice fish, and jaleo. So now I know who did those. That kind of confirms that. Can't always believe on the internet. Some may say Disney, but I know they are not Disney. Because I know some of them were Ray Young designs. So Ray Young was the local artist, um, worked for the Mantuck Ship Building Company, did other companies, their design drawings for their products, things like that. Uh, it started because the commander of USS Keat put out the request to three different artists to draw him a sketch of the insignia. Well, he did the sketch and also a full color print, completed insignia, and they loved it and went with it. Um, he was given very little information, so he had to rely on his talent and his imagination, which you'll see. Well, cr no, Kraken. Kraken. We now know as more of the octopus squid-like sea creature. All he was told, though, was it was a sea monster. They didn't have Google back then, so he used his imagination. Um, but one sketch that wasn't approved right away was the original sketch for Maccabi. Um, it's commonly known as the ladyfish. So that makes sense, right? Commander didn't like it because he thought it, the men would get too excited. <laughs> So there's his uh, winning picture or drawing for Keat. Uh, because of that, he was given the go ahead to produce the remaining nine submarines that we had here. So he did the last 10. Um, <clears throat> actually, the crew of Kraken loved the design so much that they painted it on their sail, which is basically a no-no. The Navy hated that because you're not supposed to be able to identify subs or the enemy's not supposed to be able to identify you, but you know, they said, forget it, we're painting it. Um, we got Lagarto and Lamprey. The banner uh, behind the Lagarto fish is an L-shaped pennant um, that flies along with the commissioning. Um, it's a pickerel shape. Uh, Lamprey and lizard fish, which will be on the next page, basically were Designed like the fish, lamprey, long eel, and lizard fish. Well, a lizard kind of looks like a fish. Um, that was his design. Loggerhead loaded down with action with two torpedoes and a deck gun. Loggerhead turtle. Maccabi, Maccabi, however you want to say it, Mapiro. Mapiro is actually known as the sleeper fish. So that's why he's in a hammock with an alarm clock. I remember the original was this one, not the fish. Uh, Menhaden, the last two, and Marrow. Menhaden is actually uh, a type of fish that was used by indigenous people as fertilizer. So that's why he designed the insignia to have a fierce fish wearing battle headdress. Uh, Marrow is known to stay close to the bottom of the sea in search of prey. That's the only one that confuses a lot of us because it's hard to see three, seven, eight. Sometimes I confuse it with three. Um, uh, Ray Young also got the contract for four of the East Coast subs, including Corsair. That matches half beak. I'm not really sure what happened there. Uh, Cusk and Greenfish. So in all, Walt Disney's influence with everything um, <clears throat> they spent almost the entire war in debt, around 1.2 million in about 1942. But Walt was passionate about his company and the contributions that they did during the war effort. Um, Army and Navy mainly relied on Disney for their training films, more so than any other Hollywood company. They helped with the U.S. and Canadian governments to sell hundreds of millions of dollars worth of savings bonds. Uh, nearly 1,300 Allied military units received the coveted Disney-designed insignia. Disney convinced millions of Americans to pay their taxes on time to help fund the war. And they also entertained and put smiles on the faces of wartime audiences. So it's an actually um, interesting uh, image here. So this was uh, designed in 1942 for a magazine. Uh, characters are from Disney's menagerie to take part in home front and frontline activities. So Donald Duck, 
uh, symbolizes the Marines. And the pen that is now equal to the sword, he's carrying a sword and a, and a fountain pen there. Well, other characters represent a variety of wartime roles. So the thrifty pig symbolizes the mighty might of industry. Minnie Mouse is a Red Cross volunteer. Dopey the dwarf purchase war bonds. Flower the skunk is a member of the chemical warfare service. <laughs> it works. Uh, Thumper the rabbit is the army signal corps. Uh, insignia character, characters for the Flying Tigers and the PT Boat, the Mosquito Squadron, uh, are represented in the sky, representing the more than 1,200 insignia that they designed for those uh, different units. Wow. And <laughs> Has anybody in this room ever seen a launching of a submarine? Can't wait. Wars? On a film? No, 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 no. <laughs> you have? I was here for the Pedo. Pedo? Wow. 1942, I was wow. about 10 years old. Well, you, you weren't on the other side of the bank and got wet, did you? You were in a dry zone? <laughs> we got wet. <laughs> we were right across. She in. <laughs> yeah, you learn your lesson on the pedo. <laughs> Sorry. Asked if anyone in the audience had seen um, any of the subs being launched, and he saw the pedo. Any other questions? Holland, the same engineer who built the Holland, Holland. Don't know. <laughs> Not sure. I want me to repeat that one. Um, is the Holland, John Holland, the designer of the Holland Tunnel in New York as well? I didn't see anything about a tunnel. I just saw <laughs> submarines and fish. Um, so that I can't tell you. We all got off of school later. They closed the school when the first yeah. sub went in. Yeah, no one was going to go to school and miss that, right? <laughs> Teachers, I forget it. <laughs> Besides that, my dad worked on all of it. Oh, wow. That's awesome. I hear that by the end of the submarines, though, they stopped letting kids off from school, so they just skip. Yeah. Because right. by 28, 26, you know, <laughs> yeah, saw it already. Somewhere in the middle, when they launched another submarine, they let the families of the men working in the shipyard one of the mm. Yeah, that's neat. They cranked them out left and right here. The first, the contract for the first 10, the number 10 rock was completed 600 some days ahead of schedule. That's why they got a contract for 20 more. So they were launching them one a month. The commanding officers all wanted to come back to Matterhorn to get another submarine because they were built so well. Mm hmm. I also, in some of my research, found uh, instructions for the, I think it was the Hammerhead crew on what to expect in Manitowoc. And number one, Manitowoc is a good town with good people, basically. So it was interesting. <laughs> Any other comments? But, yeah. Just for the internet, it, it's not the same Holland. Oh, it's not the same Holland. Thank you. <laughs> where, does, where does the HS? As Hunley fit into the whole submarine history. I had that in here and I took it out. Um, Hunley uh, technically was Confederate sub. Um, it's um, known as the first submarine to sink an enemy vessel. Um, there was an eight-man crew. They actually had three crews. The first two didn't make it. Uh, the first i try to remember. The first crew, I think, five made it. Three died. Second one, they all died. Third and successful final crew in sailing. Um, was it the Housatonic? Or is that? No, that's Turtle. I remember now. Uh, but they, they had a, like a spar on the end into the wooden ship, pulled back, and then um, didn't make it themselves. The wreck was found and brought up in 2005. 
Um, they recovered all the crew and they all received military honors at a burial. So there's all three crews in one section of a cemetery that was donated by the guy who owned that plot. So they're still working on it. When they don't work on it, it sits in water. When they want to work on it some more, they drain the tank, work on it. So that way it doesn't deteriorate. It's been in water. I think it was 140 years later is when the crew was laid to rest. So it was in water quite a while, but it's still a really cool exhibit and museum too. Once they the oh. mm -hmm. He said one of the sinkings happened at the dock. Maybe that's the one where some of the crew survived. <laughs> Forget which was which, but that makes more sense. Because <laughs> if you see the thing in real life, it is tiny. I mean, you know it's tiny, but they, they had to sit hunched the entire time, move the big things. Brave guys. <laughs> You good? You want to finish? Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I hope everyone will join me once again in thanking Karen for her excellent presentation. Uh, I would also like to shout out all the other people who've helped bring this um, talk today. So Cam in the back running all of the internet stuff. Um, Lizzie and Beth and Emily, um, who have been helping in the front end, you might have seen them when you were getting your drinks, as well as uh, Greg, and also Hannah for bringing out some of our lovely collections so that you can see some of the really cool um, pieces of art and prints. Um, so yeah, so let's give a round of applause for them as well. Thank you so much. Um, if you guys enjoyed this program and you want to see more like it and you want to keep um, programs like these free, please consider donating to the museum or becoming a member. Um, I will say if you've ever considered donating to the museum, this month is a fantastic month to do it um, because we are right now doing something called the 28 Boats Campaign because uh, it is February. There are 28 days in there. Each day is going to celebrate one of the submarines built here in Manitowoc. Um, if you guys donate $28, you will be entered into a drawing um, where you might get the opportunity um, to actually be in the boat while we're doing an engine start. Um, so that's a super cool experience. I will say that I have gotten the opportunity to do that. It is it is uh, something that you will not ever forget. It is truly magnifying, or not magnifying, electrifying. You don't get electrocuted though. <laughs> um, so it's super, super cool. Um, so if you were ever thinking about donating to the museum, um, this is a great time to do it. If you want more information about that, you can either go onto our website or ask us at the front desk. Um, Besides that, um, thank you so much for coming. Next month, we are having our next talk is going to be on March 2nd um, at 6.30 again, same time. Um, and it is going to be with um, uh, Kari Knutson from UW-Madison. And she is going to be talking about Mildred Fish Harnack, who was a Wisconsin-born woman who was the only person um, to, or the only American woman to be um, executed by Hitler's direct order. Um, so she was accused of being a spy against uh, the Nazi regime. So it's gonna be a really interesting story. Um, so I hope that you guys come out for that as well. Um, and yeah, so uh, yeah, keep a keep an eye on our, our website and all that. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.